Uh, well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, so as a lot of you know, I take a pretty organismal approach when I think about conservation, um, and this talk will be sort of a reflection of that. Um, and in particular, I focus for a lot of my dissertation research on lizards, which is a group that I care quite a bit about. Um, but before I sort of delve into that, I do want to take a step back and just talk briefly about sort of a broader context and sort of how I go about prioritizing where I choose to, to focus my attentions. Um, <clears throat> and so, there we go. So one of the ways that biologists in general prioritize where they work on the globe, um, and this is one of many and it's by no means a, a, an unflawed system, um, but it's called these, these biodiversity hotspots. And so these are areas worldwide that have been identified um, based on, on three, three primary characters. One being high biodiversity relative to the rest of the globe. Uh, the second being high levels of endemism. Uh, and the third being lots of or high levels of um, human modification of the, of the landscape. So either habitat loss or degradation of, of that landscape. And so what people who are proponents of this sort of idea use to sort of justify that prioritization is that you're sort of getting the biggest bang for your buck, if you will, biologically speaking, in terms of the, the sort of preservation, the, the yield that you're getting per unit area of, of preservation, um, and preserving those areas that are maybe more in need in terms of immediate levels of threat than others. Um, and so this is something that I, I particularly like as a, as a prioritization me measure, <clears throat> um, although again, it's, it's by no means you know, the only one that anyone should use. Um, and so I focus in particular on this region, so the Mesoamerica hotspot or the Central America hotspot. And so what I'm going to talk about today is work that's based on uh, some, some projects that I've been doing in that region of the globe. Um, and so one of the taxonomic groups um, that really exemplifies sort of that, that biodiversity, that endemism, and that threat that is uh, so endemic within the Mesoamerica hotspot is this particular group of lizards. And these are the arboreal alligator lizards uh, in the genus Abronia. <clears throat> and so I've got three, three of those uh, 28 described species that are within this genus illustrated here on this slide. Um, and they are, as the name indicates, uh, strictly arboreal. So they spend most, if not all, of their time uh, in trees. Um, and in particular, they've actually speciated allopatrically uh, in montane forests across the Mesoamerica region. So most of Mexico, southern Mexico, through Guatemala, <clears throat> and into parts of Honduras and El Salvador. Um, and so each one of those black dots that you see there on that map, those essentially map to existing cloud forest areas in that region. And each one of those patches roughly corresponds to an individual species within this, this genus. Um, and so one of you know, the species that I, I focus on in this talk um, is this particular species, uh, which is bright green. Um, known as Abronia gruminia. And so I'm going to use the Latin name because there's the, <laughs> the common name that's accepted is one that I do not like particularly well because it's a mouthful. Um, and so I'll just refer to it as Abronia or Abronia gruminia for the purposes of the talk. Um, and this species sort of has the same problems that most of the species in this genus have. So it's got a pretty small range, as you can see, just that one black patch there. Um, and that that threat is due primarily to habitat loss and, and degradation, um, with a little bit of impact from the pet trade, although I won't, won't talk about that uh, any further. Um, so just a little bit of background into the, the species itself. Um, so it is considered protected through, through all of its range, both at a global scale by the IUCN, and also within Mexico, where it is endemic. Um, so it's only known within Mexico from three states, so Veracruz, Puebla, and Oaxaca. Um, and like most Abronia, it is a obligate uh, arboreal cloud forest inhabitant. Um, and so within that habitat, it's one of the most threatened ecosystems and habitat types within the Mesoamerica biodiversity hotspot. Um, and so it's, it's you know, undergone really dramatic both declines in terms of aerial extent and also in terms of habitat quality. Um, and one thing I just want to draw your attention to here with this, this slide is that so it, it, the species does undergo uh, change in coloration as it ages. So the, the gray one up on the upper right there, that's a juvenile. And then as they age, they turn that brilliant uh, bright green color, which is really wonderful. Um, so at my study site, which is on the border between the states of Veracruz and Puebla, <clears throat> you see a lot of that, that habitat loss and degradation 
um, that's so common throughout the range, not only of the species, but other, other critters in the group. Um, and so that takes several forms, and one of the big questions that we have about the species is what its habitat needs actually are. Um, and furthermore, how susceptible it actually is or adaptable it is to fragmentation and to disturbance of its habitat. Um, and those are relevant questions because the government of Mexico and a lot of international and local NGOs are really promoting this species and the genus as a whole as a flagship for cloud forest conservation in Mexico and in the Mesoamerica area. Um, but in order to do that, we really need to understand a little bit more about the basic biology of these creatures, which by virtue of the fact that they spend most of their time up in the trees, they're, they're quite poorly known. Um, and so at my study site, just to illustrate sort of really briefly some of the differences in habitat and sort of variations that I wanted to sort of look across and, and compare the lizard's behavior and adaptability to. So there's a lot of intact forests still at, at the site where I work. Um, and so that's imaged here. And so most of that is relatively undisturbed or, or totally undisturbed. So old growth forest that's never been logged. Um, but then in, in growing areas in that, <coughs> in that region, ooh, and that got cut off, so that should say disturbed forest, um, is areas where you know, human, human impacts have really led to changes on that landscape. Um, and those changes are due to things like international and local tourism. Um, logging of the forest for, for the logs themselves, for paper products or for firewood, um, and also for cattle production um, and crop production as well, primarily corn. Um, and so in this area, this is one of my study sites, you get not only, oops, not only fragmented forest, so little chunks like this that are more or less isolated by pasture or grassland, but you also get some secondary regenerating forest as well. Um, and so trying to think of how the lizard's actually using that landscape and if particular perturbations are something that it avoids and is only you know, restricted to intact forest, that's one of the things that I wanted to get at. Um, in addition, within that sort of disturbed category of forest, there's forest that has very different sort of characteristics in the understory level. And so one is what I call pasture understory, where basically all of the shrubs and small trees have been cleared away and it's been transitioned into just a pure grass, which the local people use for ungulate grazing, both cattle and sheep. Um, and so contrast that to sort of a, a semi-natural understory, which is cyclically logged for the shrubs and, and saplings uh, to be used for firewood and also for um, fence posts and things like that. Um, and so this is in addition to intact forest, which obviously has a much more diverse understory. Um, and so looking at sort of those, those different habitat types and saying, well, what, what is the lizard doing? How is it using those habitats? Or is it using them differently? Um, are sort of primary questions. And then within the forest itself, there's diversity, although it's, it's relatively low in terms of what actually the, the components of the forest are. So it's an oak-dominated forest with two species of oak in the genus Quercus uh, being dominant. And then the understory is primarily dominated by a third species. Um, known as the Tejocote or Critigas Mexicana. Um, and so it's nice to sort of have that diversity because you can compare without getting too bogged down in you know, multiple different comparisons about what a lizard might be preferring. So it's a really useful site for that. And then because this is an arboreal species, bromeliad growth or epiphytes that grow up in the canopy are believed to be very important for uh, the species in terms of shelter and in terms of, of food. So they're generalist insectivores to the best of our knowledge, and there's a lot of bugs that live in these, these bromeliads. Um, and so the diversity is, is a little bit less important. I just want to draw your attention. So there's three, three dominant species. But what's more interesting is that there's a lot of variation in terms of bromeliad abundance in particular trees and in particular areas of the forest. And what we don't know is if that also could potentially be uh, affecting the distribution or abundance of, of the lizard. So with that sort of broad contextualization of the habitat, um, there were sort of three, three chief questions that I wanted to, to get at and which I'll talk about and present for this this talk. And so first being, what is sort of the, the specialization or, or generalist nature of the lizard, um, in particular relative to the tree species that I mentioned, and also to bromeliad density, if those seem to affect their, their abundance or distribution or, or use of the habitat. <clears throat> uh, second is how often they're actually moving. So there's some evidence to suggest that they only live in one tree uh, their entire lives. Um, but I'm not particularly <laughs> uh, sort of affiliated with that belief, and, and as we'll see, there's, there's a reason for that. Um, but so it's a relevant question for understanding, well, how, 
how far do these things move? Do they need just tiny fragments of forest to persist? Or can they sort of deal with, deal with fragmentation and disturbance? And then just disturbance in general, so how susceptible they are to those anthropogenic impacts on the habitat and on the landscape, um, and if they respond well or if they respond poorly to that. So the method that I use is one that's pretty standard in, in uh, ecological studies, and so that's attaching a transmitter to the lizards and then using the signal that's emitted by that transmitter to follow them where they go. And so it's something that's really, really necessary for this species because they're quite cryptic when they're up in the canopy. Um, and so you can see the, the data that I was able to gather, and unfortunately I do feel somewhat self-conscious about this because you know, when, you, when you talk to people who study things like turtles, they can get much, much more data purely by virtue of the fact that they can use much larger transmitters that have a longer battery life. Um, so this is sort of the best that we can do, given that these lizards are only about a foot long and generally weigh less than, less than 20 grams. <clears throat> so transmitters, you know, you try and keep transmitters to at least 10% or less of the, the animal's body weight. <clears throat> and so what this looks like when you get them mounted on the lizard is it's essentially like a little fanny pack, <clears throat> if you will. <laughs> Um, so it's attached with glue and with little bands of monofilament line. Um, and I have no reason to believe that that, so the, again, keeping the weight low and keeping it external, I have no reason to, to believe that that was affecting their, their movement abilities. Um, and I was able to see one of my lizards actually successfully mate. So I, you know, I'm pretty, pretty confident that they're not, that the, you know, the study method is not influencing what it is that I'm actually looking at with the study. Okay. So those are the methods. So then getting back to sort of those three sets of questions, just sort of looking at each of them in turn with respect to the data that I was able to gather. Um, and I will say that this is sort of still preliminary in terms of my, my level of analysis of the data, um, but there are several trends that I think are, are quite strong at this point um, that speak to those three questions that I outlined earlier. So I'll just sort of go through them each in turn. So our first question, just to reiterate how specialized or generalized are these critters in terms of their, their habitat usage. Um, and it turns out that they're quite generalistic. So they will use trees seemingly with no, no relative preference for either tree species or trees that have high or low uh, bromeliad densities. Um, and so that was, that was quite interesting to see and, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Question two is again how, how far they're moving or how frequently they're changing trees. Um, and they change trees quite frequently. So on average, between five and six individual trees were being occupied by, by the lizards. Um, and they would change those trees or move from tree to tree on average between every two, two to five days during periods of good weather. Um, and something that's quite consistent across, you know, not only lizards but vertebrates in general is that the males were moving more than the females because this was the breeding season, so they're looking for, for mates. And then question three, getting to disturbance and their adaptability to that. Um, and rather surprisingly, at least to me, was that they were quite adaptable. So I had several lizards occupy very tiny fragments of forest that were isolated in a pasture. Um, and I had two lizards actually cross pastures that's you know, just, just pure grass with no, no real cover for them. So they seem to be adaptable to that. And in terms of the different forest types and understory types that I described earlier, there was no real signal in terms of their, their preference for either of those. Um, <clears throat> and that wasn't as if they were, they were residing for just a short period in, in places where I would consider to be sort of less quality or poor quality habitat. They would stay for weeks on end in the same, same area with no, no apparent desire to, to be moving. So implications. So <clears throat> all of those results, those three results are, are contrary to what sort of is existing in the literature with respect to this group. Um, and unfortunately, what, what is existing is that you know, it's, it's not particularly well supported. So this is the first study of its kind with this group. Um, and it at least seems to indicate that sort of our, our conventional wisdom could use some, some updating. Um, obviously, this is something that needs to be replicated. It's a, a 28 species group. Um, and so just trying to draw conclusions for all of those species based off of one, into one species is, is obviously something that we want to try and avoid. <clears throat> But overall, the results also, sort of a, a big conclusion, is that they do support the valuation of this species as a flagship um, because it's something that's really interdigitated with, with humans. Everyone on the landscape really knows it's there. They're familiar with it because it's not something that's isolated to the mountaintop where nobody goes. Um, and so what's difficult <laughs> is that that narrative of using it as a flagship is actually in conflict with sort of local people's perceptions in a lot of cases. Um, 
because for reasons that are still a little bit mysterious, the local people generally, and this is true for, for Mexico and, and other countries where the lizard occurs, um, they believe them to be venomous, and so they, they tend to kill them on sight. Mm -hmm. And so trying to, to sort of negotiate those conflicting perceptions with conservationists wanting to sort of use them to help raise awareness about these ecosystems, and the local people thinking, well, why are you picking this species? <laughs> um, so with that, I will take any questions. I'm sorry, I went a little over. Thanks. <laughs>